We're very pleased to welcome um, John Rizzo for the second of our speaker series this fall, which will continue into the spring and onwards from there. Um, John is the um, CEO and co-founder of the New Mexico Innovation Triangle. Um, he's also an entrepreneur um, and a Silicon Valley, um, Silicon Valley entrepreneur. And most importantly, he is on the Anderson um, Anderson School Board, School Board of Excellence. So we are um, thrilled to have him um, involved with Anderson, continue, continuing to be involved um, with Anderson, and um, thrilled to have him here to talk with us a little bit about go-to-market strategies um, this afternoon. Um, and I will um, turn it over to John to speak for a little while, and then um, we'll have some time for Q and A. So hopefully the audience will. Um, have some questions after John has some of his Thanks so much. Turn it over. Can, everybody, can everybody hear me? All right. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for, for taking the time. I know you've got plenty of things to do. I'll try to keep my head moving back and forth here. Um, but uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, a summary as to what I'm going to cover today. I assume that since most of you are here to learn about go-to-market and entrepreneurship, you probably have some interest in that. Uh, but I'm hopeful that even if you are not uh, clearly focused in that particular area, that there'll be some learnings here as well in general with, uh, with respect to, to tech and business and so on. Uh, and so what I, I'll really focus on today is, is sort of several things. First, I, I just want to set a little bit of a context as to who I am and why I'm here to give you the ability to sort of translate kind of what's coming out of my head into, into this, uh, this presentation, because I look at go-to-market strategies and entrepreneurship you know, through a lens of, uh, of about 40 years or so, mostly in Silicon Valley, so I've got that uh, perspective, um, which colors my point of view uh, very clearly. So I've got a bias based on that, that experience. Uh, for good or for better or for worse, that's the, the reality of the situation. Um, and so we'll talk about that, um, and then I want to spend a little bit of time on go to market in the context of entrepreneurship, which is a little different than you might think about go to market in the context of a startup or business in general, in general, which, which more, more often than not, we think about go to market as sales and marketing. That's sort of the simple reductionist view of go to market. Um, my view is a little bit different uh, based on, on this, uh, this time that I spent in the next slide. And then we'll just talk about strategy for, for go to market and so on. There's, gonna, there's a lot of data in here and uh, this presentation is, is, is sort of crushed down uh, from a class that I used to teach at Stanford that went on for seven weeks, and each, each night was a couple hours. And so what I've attempted to do is to pull out the high points and reduce it down. But th I know the slides are going to be available to you uh, offline, and so if some of the charts and graphs get a little bit mind-numbing, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to review them later, but I'm just trying to get some concepts of art. Uh, uh, right. So quick background on me. So on the left-hand side there, uh, that's my father, who was an Air Force um, colonel who actually ran the uh, Air Force Research Lab here in Albuquerque back in the early 70s when dinosaurs ruled the Earth. So, so my perspective uh, from, from uh, New Mexico comes way back from that point of view. Uh, that other person on the left with the red circle is me, and then on the lower right is Bill Gates, who I think everybody probably knows got arrested for driving a car without a license at about the same time ended up moving to, uh, to Seattle. And I always think about what would have happened to New Mexico if, if Bill had not driven that car and not been arrested and stayed here. So uh, I've got roots uh, very deeply in New Mexico. Uh, my father ended up getting transferred back to Lawrence Livermore Lab, which is a very large national lab uh, in Livermore, California. And for those of you who don't know about Livermore, it's about an hour to the, uh, to the east of San Francisco which means it's on the foothills of Silicon Valley. So I ended up getting an engineering degree, electrical engineering degree, and then uh, spent my life in, mostly in Silicon Valley. Uh, and so that gives you a little history as to why I'm back here. So I've worked for companies that you've heard of like Apple and Intel and Oracle. Um, I was responsible for flash memory at, uh, at Intel, which is now probably a $400 billion market. I was on the, uh, the team in 1983, beginning 83, that launched the first Macintosh. And, Steve Jobs was about, uh, his office was about 20 feet from my cube, and I could tell you lots of stories about him at some other point. Um, and so I've been involved in some of these large companies and also been uh, very involved in some uh, early stage startups, either as a CEO or a board member or co-founder. Um, in the last 10 years, I've, I've uh, provided investors about 
internal rate of return on their investments in companies I've been on, which is a, which is a pretty good number. In my last deal, I delivered a 7x multiple of cash on cash return over a period of three years, which is another good multiple. So moved out here to Santa Fe. I live in Santa Fe permanently, uh, largely to retire, and discovered pretty quickly that retirement is not my cup of tea. And so embarked on this notion called the New Mexico Innovation Triangle, which I'll uh, cover in a moment as to what we're trying to do there. So think about me from the perspective of a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Uh, that's sort of my, my background with, a, with an engineering uh, degree. Uh, and so the triangle is really meant to be a container for creating an innovation economy in New Mexico. We originally thought about connecting Los Alamos, Santa Fe, and Albuquerque into a triangle. The counties that are underneath them, about a million jobs. And then we decided there's a much bigger triangle if you extend down to Las Cruces and up to Farmington and so on. And, and our belief now is that uh, because of the rural nature of New Mexico, the new uh, opportunity for remote work that's been brought on by COVID and the emergence of wireless uh, broadband that was uh, essentially created by Elon Musk and Starlink, there now creates an opportunity for us to build a very large triangle to capture not only uh, people who live in urban areas in the state, but those who live in rural areas as well. And so ultimately what we're trying to do with this idea is to fuel improvement in, in lives through economic growth. Uh, we have a very, uh, sort of very narrow focused aperture economy in the state here, oil and gas, which is not a recipe for, for great success decades from now, tourism, which doesn't work well in a pandemic, and government. Uh, and so the notion is if we can build a tech economy in uh, New Mexico or an innovation economy in New Mexico, we can create a whole set of new jobs that are clean, that are well-paying, that create opportunities for New Mexico, New Mexicans across the state in all walks of life. So that's what we're trying to do. And this really involves three big areas, uh, public policy, which is about uh, improving the tax situation in New Mexico to attract entrepreneurs, uh, education transformation to crank out graduates, either in high school or college that can fill these new economy jobs and involves venture capital and entrepreneurship. Uh, there's very little, uh, relatively speaking, venture capital investment in New Mexico. In fact, in 2019, the total venture capital investment was about $120 million. Uh, in California at the same year, it was uh, $80 billion. So we're 800 times less than California, even though our state has 2 million people and California has 40 million people. So the numbers are way off with respect to the amount of capital that goes into entrepreneurship here. And if you talk to Dean Montoya, she'll say, and I pay her a penny every time I re repeat this, that for every 1% increase in entrepreneurship, there's a 2% decrease in poverty. So to the extent that we can enable an entrepreneurial economy, it has great benefits for the state. And then finally, there's a real estate part of this, which, which says, look, if we're gonna create 175,000 new jobs in a state of 2 million people, uh, there's not enough housing for the people that already live here. So what are we gonna do about housing and office space and so on for those that come in? Uh, and so my, uh, my, my background is colored by three important mentors. Um, and this will give you some perspective about how I think about go to market. Uh, all three of these gentlemen are, are no longer with us. Uh, so Steve Jobs, who always said, among many other things, that people don't really know what they want until you show it to them. And I believe that to be true in New Mexico as well. Until uh, people see the benefits of an innovation economy here, it's hard to conceptualize why we'd want one. Um, there's a gentleman named Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel, who, who said that uh, complacency uh, breeds problems and only the paranoid survive which means that in new situations, I tend to ask a lot of questions so that I'm not uh, blindsided by historical perspective. And then finally, um, Art Kohlmeyer, who was very successful, but, uh, but largely unknown entrepreneur uh, in Silicon Valley, said the only path to heaven is always through hell, uh, which I found to be very much the case uh, in startups uh, throughout my entire life. Uh, so even when uh, we were at, uh, at Intel on what is now a very big market, and even at Apple in the early days of Macintosh, uh, those projects and those markets were extraordinarily difficult to develop, uh, and we did go through hell to create them. And there have been there are plenty of stories that probably are untold about Google, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and others, where these companies have faced a moment in time when their success was uh, was hanging on the edge of a knife, and they could have fallen off the left hand side and become forgotten memories, uh, or they could have fallen off the right hand side and been very successful companies, which were they were. So there's always these issues. Of, uh, of very difficult processes when you're starting uh, uh, starting companies and trying to grow and transform the world. So why are we here? So entrepreneurs in general are forward-looking people. They look about the look, they look at the possibility for creating a new future rather than looking backward at the past. As a result, they tend to be much more optimistic in their thinking 
and much less objective in their thinking. If you uh, wanted to start a company, uh, you'd have to be a little bit crazy because you would believe that you could change the future. Uh, and if you didn't think you could change the future, you wouldn't even bother. So there has to be a little bit of a positive bias toward creating things and transforming the world. And, and the other problem with entrepreneurs is that rules generally are not, um, are generally not rules, they're suggestions. It's kind of like when you get to a stop sign and you kind of roll through it. The stop sign was really not a rule, it was a suggestion. And so I think part of the issue that we all face as entrepreneurs is that we've got to be very focused on what drives us to be successful at creating the future, but also uh, creates issues for us as we grow our companies. And so the, these two sayings are pretty, pretty interesting. You know, what would you attempt if you knew you couldn't fail? And the, and the core layer to that is that if you thought you might fail, you probably wouldn't even make an attempt. And, and so there's this issue of how do you balance these two out? And, and when we talk about go-to-market strategy, we're going to spend some time on, on those particular issues. Uh, and so essentially being an entrepreneur is hard because you're trying to change and transform the world. And I've always thought about startups being simply a, a series of near-death experiences one after the other. And successful startups, Paul's laughing because you've been in this world, successful startups are those that don't, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that are simply able to navigate through a near-death experience. They can see a near-death experience coming up and they figure out a way to navigate around. It's almost like if you're driving on 25 North to Santa Fe and you see in the distance that there's a car that's swerving out of control and about ready to crash. If you're thinking about what you might do before you get to the accident, you might avoid being a part of that yourself. But if you're not aware of it, you just uh, you end up being part of the calamity. So the issue here is this notion of managing these near-death experiences and getting through them. And the right go-to-market strategies, as I'll, as I'll talk about later, uh, helps you get through them. OK, so that gives you a, a, a high-level context. So when I think about go-to-market, it's a, it's a relatively simple term that's a, a, got a much broader view than simply marketing and sales. In my view, it's taking an invested amount of capital and transforming it to a much larger amount of capital in a predictable time frame and in a predictable way. So if somebody uh, gives you a dollar to start a business, uh, it would be really good if you could say to them, well, I'm going to take your dollar and I'm going to turn it into 10, and it's going to take me a year to do that. Um, and that's, a, uh, that's the basis on which you allocate your time to go and in, involve yourself in this venture. And that's the reason that they make an investment in you for that. And the more predictable you can get about how long it will take and what the return will be, the more likely you are to be able to run your business successfully. Most investors, uh, whether or not they're yourself with your own time or your friends and family who give you money or venture capital investors or banks, they're looking for trust. And trust comes from being able to predict the investment of capital and when it's going to return over time horizon. And the, the more you sort of mess up those numbers, what, where somebody says, I'm going to give you, a, uh, I'm going to take a dollar, I'll give you $10 back in, in a year. If they give you a dollar and you give them 50 cents back in 10 years, that, that doesn't create a lot of trust. Uh, and so the notion here is building this system so that you can grit a, a, a predictable return. So a, a, the go to market activity is really a process by which you take an invested amount of capital and, and return it to investors over time in a predictable way. And it's really important, I think, uh, for all of you who, are, who may be entrepreneurs to think about your time is invested capital as well. And so when you think about starting a company or running a company, you need to think about what is the time value of my life? And if I'm going to spend 90 hours a week doing something, and I'm going to do it for three or four or five years, what is the appropriate return on my time? And oftentimes, entrepreneurs forget about that. They don't pay themselves with anything. They don't think about the value of their time, which doesn't create a really clear view of what the business should be. OK, and so it's important to understand, if you look at venture capital and you look at the typical economics of startups, uh, that most startups fail. Uh, this was a study that was done by Stanford uh, maybe 10 years ago. And essentially what it says is that about a third of companies crash and burn about a third exceed expectations and about a third meet expectations. And if you blend up, you blend all the returns together from zero to seven and a half times, the average returns across all startups are about three X. So if an investor gives you a dollar, then on average, you're going to give the investor back three. That's generally what happens. Now, the problem with this particular model is that if you end up looking at the, the, the model in general and you remove the top third that exceed expectations, that is, you take out the ones that are successful. The bottom two thirds are ep create epic failure. Uh, an investor gives you a dollar, and you give that investor back 60 cents, which means they lost 40 cents on every dollar they gave you. 
So what this suggests is that most venture capitalists and most investors in early stage companies have to manage through a portfolio. They need a lot of bets to make sure that if they make 10 investments, that at least three of them are going to exceed expectations and generate return. Because if they don't make 10 bets, then the odds are that, uh, that they're gonna be uh, essentially in the bottom two thirds here. And that doesn't generate, generate enough return to do it again. Because the key to, to successful investing here is to continue to have a machine that goes forward. And so really important to re recognize that for you, uh, if you start a company and you're out seeking investment, they're going to look at you and try to figure out, are you in the, which, court, which, which third are you in? And they're not really getting, necessarily gonna know that at the beginning, but they're thinking about it that when they evaluate you. So essentially what the process is about is you think about a product or service, what you wanna do and build, uh, you finance it, you then uh, finance a sales and marketing team to go sell it, you then figure out how much margin and revenue you're gonna create from that selling that product or service, and then you plow it back in to grow the company more and more. So it's product development, you, you spend money to develop a product or service, then you spend money to sell and market the product, then you take the capital that comes from those sales uh, and you, you feed that back into the machine. And if you end up uh, generating enough margin defeated in the machine, then you can go back to investors and say, look, you gave me a dollar, I gave you three dollars back, give me another dollar so I can do it again. That's sort of the cycle that ends up happening. So that's the notion of, of this, is you create a capital appreciation loop. And so I think about uh, these startups as being, again, a series of near-death experiences. And this is just a, sort of an illustration that talks, I, I want to cross a bridge and there are landmines in my way. And, all, and we probably experience these things. Um, you can't hire the right people to develop your product or service. Uh, if you do hire the right people and you develop a product, uh, the product doesn't work the way it was expected to. Or if the product works the way it was expected to, the sales team forgot how to sell it. <laughs> and what I've, I've discovered in my career that there's always this sort of interesting Murphy's Law. If the product works, the sales team forgets how to sell it. If the product doesn't work, the sales team can sell plenty of them. Uh, so that's the, that's the conundrum that you face. Even situations where uh, you know, perhaps a couple mar got married, founded a company, and the husband or wife wants a divorce, and the company crashes and burns because they want to take capital out. There's all these things that get in the way of, of you know, growing these companies where you can't finance the company. And so that's sort of the ultimate outcome here. How do you survive these near-death experiences as you go through the path? And the goal of the go-to-market team at, at the most important, highest level is to not run, a run out of cash. Because the enemy of startups is lack of cash and lack of time. And so if you run out of cash, the penalties are, ex are extraordinary. And so the key of go-to-market is not to run out of cash. And so the way to think about this uh, numerically is when you start a business and you think about, okay, I'm gonna run a company for a couple of years here. I'm gonna need this amount of money to start. I'm gonna write my business plan and it's gonna tell me that I'm gonna spend this amount of money per month or per quarter. I'm gonna draw my cash balance down over time. And then at some point I'm gonna have a product to sell. I'm gonna generate margin and therefore I can start uh, generating my own capital. But in general what ends up happening is things don't happen exactly when you think they should. You hit a near death experience. And so let's say you've got a product that you're developing and you discover it's gonna take six months longer to develop than you thought that incremental six months of time means you've got to write a bigger check to your product development team, which gets you off the pace of your plan. You burn more cash than you anticipated. So that's the red line. And if you keep doing that, what ends up happening over time is you get very close to the point where you have no cash left. And when you have no cash left, essentially what ends up happening is you're now put in this really difficult position where you have to raise more money because your bank account's getting pretty thin and you want to pay your employees, probably. You probably want to pay yourself. If you've got a vendor that's provided you materials, you probably want to pay them. And at that point in time, you're, you're now forced in this entrepreneur conundrum where you, you believe in the future, but you're sort of surprised by these issues that got in the way, and now you're in a desperate situation. Do I raise more money uh, and therefore take more dilution to my stock? or do I close the company? Of course, nobody ever wants to close a company, so you're in this, in this situation where you're constantly raising capital. But the penalty of these near-death experiences get extraordinarily high when you get close to, to no money in the bank. Um, just like our personal lives, if I can't make a, a payment on my car or my mortgage, there's, there's substantial consequences for that. And so ultimately what ends up happening is you have to then evaluate what happens, right? So if I'm, I'm getting low on cash,
Uh, if friends and family have given me the money, that's sort of an embarrassment. If I've taken money out of my savings account, that creates risk for me personally longer term. Um, if banks have given me money, banks never give money without a, a very big string attached, which means that they can take over your company if you don't pay them back. Or if you've got investors who provided you equity or bought stock in your company, the penalty they, that you pay with them is that they write a check to keep you in business, but they own a lot more of the company that, uh, after the check than before the check. So you end up losing control of your business. So all these, uh, all these issues have, uh, have severe consequences. And so think about this notion of raising capital in, in the equity side of things. You know, venture capitalists give you money. Every time you raise money, you sell more shares in your company. Every time you sell more shares, you have less to yourself. And depending on how well your business grows, if it's growing really well and up and to the right, then every time you sell shares, you're selling them at a higher price. And so you, you continue to get diluted, but you don't get diluted that much. But when you're, when you're at the end of the cycle and you've got very little cash in the bank, you end up uh, selling a lot of shares and owning a lot less of your company that you worked 80 or 90 hours a week to build. And so ultimately, the thing to think about is that when you're raising venture capital or raising equity capital, there are lots of different sources, and those sources have different return requirements. Um, and this is largely based on the stage of the company. You have some funds that want to invest in seed stages or what's called Series A. Those firms love to take extraordinary risk because the returns are extraordinarily high. You have other firms who might be a, a big pension funds whose job it is really to protect the capital in the fund and therefore they, don't only, they only want to invest when, uh, when perhaps the, the company's at lower risk, generating revenue, generating profits, about ready to go public and so on. So as you raise money for your, your company, it's important to know which slot you fit into. And so if you look at the financial considerations in uh, starting a company and financing a company, there's really sort of two things to think about uh, in general, uh, equity and debt. Equity means you sell shares in the company to an investor. The good thing about that is there's alignment. Um, if you're successful as an entrepreneur, the investor is successful as an investor. Everybody's on the same page. There's, there's, no, con there's no confusion as to uh, whether or not you or your employees get paid differently than the investor gets paid. Everybody gets paid the same way. Uh, the problem with uh, equity capital is you have to sell shares in your company and sometimes it's hard to raise. Uh, debt means you go to the bank and they give you a loan. The good news about that is you're not selling them a part of your company, but the bad news about that is that they can come after your company and own it if you don't, uh, if you don't provide uh, interest payments or you're out of governance. So there's a, there's a cost with respect to strings there. Good example of this is a company called Entangle. Entangle about six months ago was sold to Arrested Networks, which is number two behind Cisco. When I first joined the board of this company five, six years ago, I was uh, asked to join to help them grow the business. First board meeting, the CEO says, well, uh, you know, our investor who is a bank uh, has decided to foreclose on a $16 million note that they provided to the company because we're out of covenants. And we spent a year trying to figure out how to solve that particular problem. So literally the company sort of stopped for a year as that financial restructuring happened, largely again because it was a debt-based deal. Uh, we ended up getting it squared away and getting it fixed and had a very successful exit with Arista, but it was a long journey because we signed an agreement with the bank that was very clear and very specific and then banks had first rights of everything. Uh, another example on the downside of equity investments was a company that I ran just until recently. Uh, we ended up selling it for a very, very good exit. Uh, but when I joined the company, and this is, uh, there's a corollary to this, uh, there was something called liquidation preference. Uh, that's a term in the venture capital world. And the liquidation preference says that an investor gets paid first when a company is uh, sold. Um, and if you're in desperate financial uh, situations, these liquidation preferences can have a multiple on them. 3x liquidation pre preference, 5x liquidation preference. So if, for example, you raise $10 million and there's a 5x liquidation preference, then the investors get the first $50 million. And most companies, by the way, when they're sold, aren't sold for it's very rare that you find a company sold for more than $200 million. And so in that particular case, um, the investor said, we've got this liquidation preference. And I said, well, that's nice, but there's no, no real employee that's going to come work at this company and work 90 hours a week for five years with a liquidation preference like that. And so you're going to have to essentially pay the employees first before the investors get paid. Now, they agreed to that because 
uh, because they hate this company to be successful. So there's there's traps in all of these areas when you're when you're taking capital from uh, from other sources. A bank gives you capital. There's a string attached to it. An investor gives you capital from an equity perspective. The terms are very important. So uh, good attorneys are important in these in these particular cases because they can help avoid these situations. Okay. So um, so to go back to uh, the other sources of capital, there's revenue and margin. Uh, and the, th the point I want to make to all of you today is that the most important thing to know, is, and this is a trap that, that uh, entrepreneurs find themselves in all the time, they talk about how much their revenue is. Uh, the revenue number is really irrelevant uh, to what's possible with respect to cash because revenue doesn't generate cash. Revenue always comes with a cost associated with it. And so the real thing that's important is margin. And margin is what's left after you pay uh, the cost of revenue uh, from your revenue line. And this is very important, very important. And uh, uh, if you take a look at Carvana more recently, they, they raised $1.3 billion. Their stock was trading at $360 a share. Now it's down around five or six. It's because they grew their revenue line extraordinarily quickly, but they didn't grow their margin line enough to, to fuel the growth of their business uh, because they weren't keeping their eye on that particular ball. Um, and so from a, uh, from a revenue perspective, you know, my point here is focus on, on the margin line rather than the revenue line. And here's an example. So we've got two cases where the revenue is $100, uh, the cost of revenue or cost of sales $150, gross margin on the left-hand side is a negative $50. So every time you sell something, you lose money. That's the short way to describe that particular scenario. <laughs> example two is uh, something you sell for 100 bucks, costs 20 bucks to sell, and you make uh, $80 in, uh, in margin on that particular example. And then if we think about rolling this out sorry, over time, and you think about, okay, we've also got expenses. So I've got to pay for office space if I've got an office, I've got to pay salaries, I've got to pay uh, for benefits for my employees, all these things I've got to spend on. That, that comes after the gross margin line. And so in example one, negative $50 in gross margin, $50 in expenses, I'm now losing $100. And after a year, I'm, I've, I've dug myself a $1,200 hole, which means that I have to figure out how to replenish the $1,200 that I've lost during that year, which means I have to raise more money, right? So that's how that cycle works. So in, the, in example one, the more, I sell, the more I sell, the bigger the financial hole I create for myself. You can do that for a while if you've got an unlimited amount of money, and people think you're doing well from a top line perspective, we can't do it forever. An example two, just the opposite, right? I've got positive margin, pays for my expenses, and at the end of the year, I know I've generated uh, incremental profit, which allows me to go back and either plow that back into the business or raise more capital based on it. So really important to keep those in mind. Lots of sources of cost in running a business. Important to consider all these things. Most times when I run into entrepreneurs, they think sales and marketing is free. <laughs> it's not cost you money. Most times they think, well, I don't need to pay myself a salary because I'm the founder. Well, true, but that's not a, that's not a pure business model. Or they forget that if, I, if I'm going to hire employees, most employees would like a health plan. That seems reasonable. Health plans are very expensive. So you've got to be really careful accounting for all this stuff or you end up building a false plan. The other thing to note about is with respect to the process flow of cash. A customer says, I'm going to buy from you. They give you a purchase order. You then invoice them. Sometimes the invoicing and the purchase orders are not at the same time, and then they decide when they're gonna pay you. That might take three, 60 days, 30 days, 120 days. Uh, and by the way, all the time, you're, you're spending money on expenses because you couldn't get an order from a customer if you didn't have a product or service to sell. And then, they, uh, then your capital consumers, like employees, benefits, and so on. And then finally, what you've got is fuel for growth, what's, what's at the end of that chain. Right? And if you focus only on, gee, I got an order at the far left-hand side of this chart, what you're ignoring is all the other steps that consume capital until you actually get cash that you can use. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a chart that articulates this. Sort of bookings is the green line that's orders. Um, the, the, uh, the expenses are the red line that always, you know, you've got, you've got to pay people. And then the gross margin line is the, yellow, is the orange line. In this example, we've assumed that there's negative gross margin until you get to a certain scale. And the gap between the, the uh, essentially the, the gross margin line and the expense line is how much money you light on fire every month. So it's important to figure out what the area under that curve is so you know what your strategy should be. 
So other key metrics to consider with respect to this, um, and I'll give some examples here. We've already talked about gross margin, uh, net promoter score. I'll, I'll cover this a bit later. But has anybody heard of net promoter score? All you have? Okay, so this was a, a technique that was designed and you're burning um, essentially uh, 100 and, or 80K a month. That means after a year, you're gonna have nothing in the bank. So it's important to understand the run rate, how many months you've got left, because money equals time. So here's some examples of net promoter scores, and this data is a little bit out, of, you know, this information is a little bit out of date, but you look at various companies, and when you've got a negative NPS score, it means that people will go out of, out of their way to not recommend you. <laughs> so I'll come up to Paula and I say, Paula, never fly on American Airlines ever, because it sucks, <laughs> right? That's a negative net promoter score. Uh, the positive net promoter scores are those where customers will say, yeah, I, I like Google, Google works well, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the key thing here is this is a measure of word of mouth marketing. And, and effectiveness there. And we'll come back to this a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this notion of, uh, I call it happy talk or customer acquisition cost. So here's an example of I spent $100,000 to acquire 1,000 customers. Those 1,000 customers then cost $100 per customer, right? And then what ends up happening is that for every sale that I make to one of those 1,000 customers, I generate $200 in gross margin. And then after the customer acquisition cost, I've got $100 left. So $200 in gross margin generated, $100 in customer acquisition cost, that means the gap is $100. So every time I end up selling something to a customer, I'm netting $100 from that transaction. Seems pretty good, right? Seems like a reasonable number. It's a positive number. It's, it's better than, than zero. Uh, and then if you, if you then don't, don't pay attention to the next slide, which is, well, what's the churn rate of my customers? How many are still buying from me if I've got a product or service after a year? And in general, in service or, or some product businesses, they churn off. Uh, there's a fall off in the, in, the, in the rate. So maybe after two years, instead of having 100% of my customers doing repeat business, I've got only 20% of my customers doing repeat business. If you think about it from that perspective, then overlay the same number, you think about what the repeat sales number is, and then you start measuring the customer acquisition cost for a customer that stays with you forever and it's a much different picture. So in this particular case, I spent $100,000 on marketing, 80% of my customers churned out after two years, which means my repeat sales were only 200, so five times lower than it was before, and my essentially my CAC on a churned out customer basis is not $100, it's $500. And then the difference between $500 in, in CAC and $200 in margin, I'm essentially losing $300 in margin every time I, I had a customer. So this means that you've got a business that doesn't really function. And so when you're thinking about this and going out to raise capital, knowing what your customer acquisition cost is and your gross margin generated per customer, assuming churn, uh, is an important metric that investors will ask you about. This is why in the cell phone business with AT&T and Verizon and so on, they spent so much time trying to figure out how you don't churn out. They lock you into two-year contracts, have you noticed? They, they, they find ways to prevent you from leaving because they know that if they spend a large amount of money to acquire you, and then you simply go on to another cell phone provider a month or two later, then all that money is lost. So that's why there's a lot of these things that you think about in, your, in, in normal life where you think, oh, why, why do I have to sign a two-year contract? Well, it's because it's exactly for that reason. So a good, another good example goes back to my days at Apple. So I was one of the things I was responsible for was the packaging of the first Macintosh. And, and you know, what the box looks like, how you open the box up, how it works and all that stuff. And Steve was just, you know, giving me a hard time pretty much every day about the packaging of the Macintosh. And finally, I just said, well, well, why do you care so much about the packaging for the Macintosh? And he said, well, it's actually pretty simple. If you don't design the packaging correctly, and it takes a customer more than 10 or 15 minutes to get utility and excitement out of the product, or they can't figure out how to make it work at all and they call us, the minute they call us, the amount of money it takes us to solve that customer's problem over the phone wipes out all the gross margin that we generated on that product. So his point to me is, John, your job with respect to the Mac packaging is to stop the phone from ringing. So we had phones then, and there's no such thing as you know, all these other techniques. So, so stop the phone from ringing, because if you stop the phone from ringing, that means that the profit on the product is gonna be good. And that's why the packaging is so important. So if, if, you, if, if any of you, you're probably all too young, but if any of you bought the first Macintosh in 1984, what you noticed when you took it out of the box, we had this uh, 
this white blow molded piece of plastic inside of which was the manual and power cord and all that stuff. Well, in order to seal this thing, we used scotch tape to keep the thing closed because when you're shipping it, it vibrates and rattles and all that stuff. Well, if any of you remember when you've got scotch tape on a piece of plastic, it ends up being really difficult to get off. You grind your fingernail into it, it's messy it's, and so on and so on. So we ended up saying, well, look, to the vendor who's gonna build these things, they have to fold a tab over on the scotch tape. So you simply pull the tab up and the tape comes off, right? It's a really trivial thing, extraordinarily trivial, but important with respect to that experience uh, Experience. Okay, so uh, with respect to marketing considerations, now you've sort of heard about the financial considerations, which is about making sure you understand the cost of near-death experience, making sure you've got enough capital to get through it, making sure you understand the cost of acquiring a customer and whether or not that cost is actually generating uh, some capital that you can plow back into the business. Then we'll, we'll shift now into some marketing considerations. So this is a, this is a positioning statement uh, codex, and it's sort of fill in the blank. And if you start a business or you're in a company and you can't fill this out, then you're in really deep trouble. Because what this says is that you cannot articulate your value proposition in a short amount of time. And so when I work with entrepreneurs, my, one of my first tasks is to say, fill this out. And if they struggle filling it out, then they don't really quite fully understand yet or don't have a handle on what they're trying to achieve in the business. So here's the same thing applied to Amazon way back when, when Amazon was only in the book business. <laughs> and if you read this statement, you understand. You understand why Amazon exists, what its unique value proposition is, who it's for, and so you can figure out, okay, if that's what we stand for, then we're gonna run our go-to-market and our whole business at aiming into that target. So again, you'll get this in the, in the notes so later when you get the distributor. Um, so here, here's another example with respect to demand generation and, uh, and CAC. So remember we talked about Net Promoter Score as a measure of word of mouth marketing? Word of mouth marketing is, is essentially free. You don't really spend any money on it. Uh, Paula, I don't have to pay Paula a dollar when she goes to Joseph's and says, this is a great product, right? She does that for free out of the goodness of her heart. And so if you look at example one and example two where you've got um, the paid CAC for customer and the free CAC for customer, which is zero, and you blend them all together in that particular case with, with essentially low net promoter score customers where you have to spend money to acquire customers because the word of mouth is low, you might spend $90 per customer to acquire those customers. On the other hand, if you have a great product and a great service and customers give you high rank, rankings and ratings on the net promoter score, then the number of free customers that you get with no marketing is a, is a larger percentage of the total. Uh, and so instead of paying for 100 customers, you pay for 10. And the other 90 are free. And that means that your blended CAC now is $10 per customer, which is obviously a much different number, which means you can acquire many more customers for much less capital. So that's why we, you know, we think about this notion of getting your uh, product or service aligned with customer needs, getting those customers to be referenceable. If you get in front of investors and they are um, unsure about whether or not you're, that you, they fully understand your business, pointing to high net promoter scores, pointing to very low customer acquisition costs, those are all clues to an investor that you have a business that could be extraordinarily uh, successful. Sales considerations. So the way the sales process works in general is that the marketing department creates awareness and leads. Those go into the sales department who end up qualifying the customers, generating um, proposals, uh, getting a contracts done, and then there's a deal that's closed. That's the process. In general, the ratio across each of these activities is really um, depressing. Let's just say that. <laughs> you start with a huge pool of, of potential people that might want to buy your product, and it gets reduced down and down and down into a very small funnel. So in general, the, ratio, the, the relationship between marketing leads, where marketing says there's a customer here, to a lead that a salesperson says, oh yeah, I can get a deal done, that's 10 to 1. And then the ratio of those leads that a salesperson says I can close to actually close is about 3 to 1. So there's a tremendous drop off in the funnel here, so it's really important when you're a, an entrepreneur thinking about these ratios because what ends up happening is that salespeople in general are even more optimistic than entrepreneurs and they'll come in and say I'm going to close a million dollar deal. Great. The reality is they're probably going to close a hundred thousand dollar deal and it's going to take a lot longer. 
If you don't think about those, those things or don't ask those questions, you can be caught up in the enthusiasm of the million dollar deal, plan your go-to-market strategy or financing strategy based on the million dollar deal, but when it's 10 times lower, you now have got a problem because you hired a bunch of people assuming the deal is going to be a million dollars in size and it's not. But it's so important to figure that out. And so in general, there's this notion of separating the wheat from a chaff, the chaff. Uh, deals that you think are going to close that never do take as much time as deals that actually will close. That's sort of the rule of thumb. So if you're if you're engaging with a customer and they, you keep saying that you're, I'm going to close this customer, I'm going to close this customer, uh, but they never close, then you could have spent all that time on a customer that actually would close, which is far more valuable. And so if you do this at scale with large numbers of, of customers and large numbers of salespeople, you can end up having most of your sales team spending, you know, 70% of their time on deals that'll never, that'll never close. It's been, instead of spending 70% of the time on those that are really going to close. Uh, so it's really important from a sales perspective and from a entrepreneurial perspective to figure this out. And so one way to do this is a series of uh, qualification criteria. There are a bunch of these around. The one that I find to be most simple is something called BANT. Um, uh, budget, authority, need, and time frame. Uh, so let's, let's go through this. Let's get, I'll give you an example. Um, I, was, I was on the board of a company that we delivered gas to cars in the middle of the night. That was our target. Very big market, extraordinarily challenging economics. Uh, and so to, to back qualify this, I could uh, call up a customer and say, um, do you have a car? Yes, I have a car. Great, okay. Uh, do you, are you responsible for paying for fuel for your car? Yes, I do. Your wife doesn't do it? No, I do. I'm responsible for, for the, 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 the budget. I've got the budget to put gas in my car every night. Um, the authority piece is, can you make the decision on your own without anybody else? You don't have to go to a higher up. You don't have to go somewhere else to get a bank loan to put gas in your car. Yes, I, I have the authority and I have the budget um, to, uh, to fill my car up with fuel. Uh, the question is need. All right. Um, so, uh, let's go to number. Let's go to time frame first. How often do you fill your car up with gas? I do it once a week. Great. So those three qualifications, I have the authority, I have the budget, and I fill my car up once a week. Seems good. Uh, then the question is, do they have a need? Uh, do you have a car? Yes, I do. Great. All four are satisfied. All four. Budget authority need, right? But if the sales rep didn't say, what kind of car do you have? Then, well, I've got a Tesla. <laughs> I fail on the need criteria, which means that only three of the four criteria are met. Therefore, that's not a viable customer. And a sales rep trying to sell gasoline to an owner of an electric car is likely not to be a very viable activity. So if you apply this model to all the leads and all the customers you're talking to, it allows you to determine which customers it is worth wasting time on or spending time on. And so the notion of the funnel, right? Awareness, intent, purchase, and so on. Again, there's another numerical rule here that if somebody's interested in your product and they're qualified so they meet the bank criteria, in general, about 25% of those that express interest and meet the criteria actually end up closing. So if you think you want to sell a million dollars worth of stuff to a set of customers in your target market through your go-to-market process, then you need to have four million dollars of people saying, I do want to buy your product. And again, this goes back to the whole notion of avoiding these near-death experiences. So missing a sales forecast is a, is a very, a very punishing near-death experience. And so being able to fully understand how you're doing is really, really important. Okay, so I'm about ready to wrap up here and we'll have some questions. So from a next steps perspective, I want to call your attention to, to these are sort of, again, books that were published in the time of the dinosaurs. There are three in particular, um, high technology marketing, high output management, and crossing the chasm. These are all uh, seminal books if you want to learn about how these things uh, work you know, from the marketing and sales perspective. The principles uh, articulated here are still very helpful even in today's world, and I know this because I was a contributor to the, the, the three books on the right. Uh, and then just to, to summarize the, the sort of the, the last 40 minutes or so, first, as entrepreneurs, you have a very uh, a unique gift of being optimistic, wanting to be transformative. That gift can get in the way, though, of success because you tend not to look at what's under the rock that's ugly that's going to crawl out and get in the way of being successful. So very important when you build your strategy to assume that things are not going to go as well as you would like them to go, and therefore you need to build in uh, what near-death experiences could be, affect my company, 
and what's the cost of each of those near-death experiences so that I can build those in uh, to the business plan so that I don't ever run out, run out of capital. Um, the GTM process helps everybody get focused because if you're thinking about our goal is to generate improved margin uh, so that we can grow and reduce the dependence that we have on outside investors, whether or not they're banks or venture capitalists, then everybody's focused on the, the growth of the business, not focused on their specific silo. And I found that most startups that end up getting into trouble are extraordinarily siloed. The marketing team says, I'm doing my job, it's the sales team that screwed up. Or the sales team says, I'm doing my job, and the product development or service development team screwed up. Or the finance person says, you know, I'm doing fine, uh, but those sales, those sales folks, you know, they're working a day a week. There's, um, so the extent that everybody is all together focused on, collectively we've got to drive this margin number up, collectively we've got to make this business function, it's nobody's fault if it's not, other than all of our faults, that helps uh, actually build a, a, a culture of teamwork and execution. Uh, the, the sales and marketing team's clearly important and necessary to the go-to-market strategy, but they're not sufficient. Uh, a good sales and marketing department can sell a bad product, but for only a limited amount of time. Uh, everything catches up. So it's really important that uh, when you think about go-to-market, you consider it in a much more holistic uh, mechanism. Uh, and if done right, essentially go-to-market uh, then anticipates these potential looming near-death experiences and anticipates those that are going to get in the way of success, which gives you enough time to get around. The last thing that you want to you be in a situation, uh, which I've had CEOs be in this situation before, where uh, you know the payroll company needs to process payroll on a Monday, uh, and they've got to, they want to process the pay payroll because there's 10 or 15 or 100 or 200 employees that want to be paid, and then on Friday I get the call saying oh, we can't process payroll on Monday because there's not enough cash in the bank. You know that's an example of a near-death experience that's extraordinarily difficult to solve. Really hard to raise funds from Friday night to Monday morning to make payroll. Uh, but if, on the other hand, you knew a month before, or two months before, or three months before, that you were going to have this impending issue, then you'd have time to, to, uh, to do something about it. Uh, so that's the, the real key of go-to-market is to anticipate these new experiences. And then finally, uh, being thoughtful and objective about the financial stuff is, a, is important. You've seen in this presentation a lot of charts and graphs and numbers. It tends to be you know, probably more analytical than you might have expected. And, and the, really the reason for this is that the numbers are a very helpful counterbalance to the optimism of an entrepreneur. Um, it, you know, numbers don't really lie that often if they're done correctly, unless you work at FTX or something somewhere. But you know, they tend to be really helpful in creating a counterbalance to, uh, to an entrepreneur that is, is going to view the world uh, from an optimistic uh, perspective, which is exactly where you want them to be. If, if, if no entrepreneurs were optimistic, we'd have no entrepreneurs, we'd have no change, we'd have no building next door. None of these things would happen unless people were thinking in a forward way. Uh, but they have to be balanced by this sort of more objective and analytical view. Okay, so I've covered a lot. Uh, thank you very much. That's my email address up there if anybody wants to connect with me. I'm also on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll get the slides out. Uh, I think at some point uh, soon, and that you know, might allow you to be uh, get more perspective on this. Any any questions that I can? I know I, was, I, was a, I have a broadband mouth, and I assume you had a broadband <laughs> broadband brain, so we should be okay. But any questions that I can? I do have one. Some? Yes, sir. Um, so when you're trying to calculate your customer acquisition cost, what are all the things going in in that, and then what are like some of the big pitfalls that get missed out? Yes. So in calculating CAC, um, you, you attach to it, um, there's fixed costs. So let's say you have a marketing manager, that's a fixed cost. That gets attached to customer acquisition cost. Or a sales team, that gets attached to uh, customer acquisition cost. And in general, salespeople get paid a base and they get paid a bonus. And some people just get paid a bonus based on what they sell. Both of those elements need to get factored in. So there's, there's uh, I call it headcount related or people related fixed costs in the business that goes into CAC. Other things like, I want to run Facebook advertising. That costs money, that's part of CAC. I want to run TikTok advertising. I want to pay for LinkedIn campaigns to find customers, that goes into the bucket. Um, th those are generally the, the, 
and those are generally in sort of the variable cost area because you can turn them up and down. If I want to buy, um, you know, placement on Google, so that when somebody types in something into the Google search bar, my company comes up to the top, that's a cost uh, in, in customer acquisition. And, and that stuff varies a lot because as competitors come in and the keyword uh, bidding process uh, and auction process gets escalated, you can find that the cost of being number one or number two or number three on a Google home, homepage varies a lot and changes a lot over time. Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. Yes. Where were you when you uh, created NPI or the NPI was created? It was, well, it was an interesting company. company. It, was, um, it was a company called Informative. Uh, and if you know, um, there are other companies of late, uh, Qualtrics is an example, uh, SurveyMonkey. Yeah. There are companies of that ilk that did online survey, surveys. Uh, the company Informative was about uh, probably 10 years before those guys. I tend to be, I tend to be more early than on time with respect to new, tra new trends. So, um, uh, so that that was the name of the company, and that whole technology was actually it was very interesting. Uh, this was probably now 15 years ago, maybe. We we had built this system. So, so in general, let's back up. When you do market research, in general, you ask multiple choice questions. Pick, you know, A, B, C, or D, whatever it is. Um, and the problem with that approach is that you can't anticipate all of the unstructured data that might be a nuance. And so we built a system where you, we'd say, uh, what do you think about the Winter Olympics? And somebody would type in, well, whatever they type in, right? Um, and instead of having a human read those comments, which is obviously very time consuming and can't be scaled, we had a computer that would do what's called nat natural language processing and it would read the comments. And it would be able to figure out based on those comments what the trend was and it grouped similar contacts. And so you could do an analytical sort of objective market research study on subjective data, which was really interesting. And so the next step in that model was, well, what happens if we ask customers how they feel about a good or, a good or service? And that's how the, how the NPS score ended up um, getting developed. And there was another very interesting and important nuance to this, uh, and I don't remember the, the professor's exact name, but there was a professor at a prominent university who had done studies of people who, who influence other people. And, he, and this person had figured out a, a simple survey that he, that he could ask anyone on earth, uh, these simple questions, maybe nine or 10 questions. And based on the answers to those questions, he could determine or she, she could determine whether or not that person was going to influence other people be inert or follow other people. So he could essentially rank every human on earth on their ability to be an influencer. And, and the interesting thing about this is that um, the way that he discovered this stuff is they would put people in a room, I don't know if it's two or three people, maybe four, a small number of people, and they, they would be asked to go sit in a conference room. Uh, and at the beginning of the meeting, they were asked to fill out a little piece of paper that described their emotions. And then, um, they did the same thing 15 or 20 minutes later. But the instructions to the people in the room were you can't say anything to anybody. You just have to sit there for 15 or 20 minutes. And what they discovered is that the person who, who was the influencer in the room, the emotions of that person would end up getting picked up by all the other people in the room, even though not a word was spoken. So if I was an influencer and I was in a surly mood, then everybody in the room would become surly. <laughs> if I was an influencer and was happy, then everybody would become happy. If I, if, and, and if, on, the, on the counter side, if you put somebody who was not an influencer in the room, then nobody would adopt the traits of the non-influencer. So anyway, there's a whole bunch of psychological work that went into this, and that all got, got mashed up into this algorithm that then yielded a net promoter score. So, and that's why, if you think about Facebook and TikTok and Instagram and all these things, the, the, the insidious piece of those technologies uh, which is the downside of tech, um, is that they use those techniques at massive scale yeah. across billions of people, which now you end up having somebody who might be an influencer, who might be if, if infecting or influencing millions of other people because they have those traits just as based on who they are. And if you end up attaching a false narrative to that person's account, which happens through bots and so on, then you end up getting all this weird stuff that goes on you know, in these uh, social media uh, technologies where bad things happen uh, because a bad actor has gotten involved. So anyway, that was a very long answer to your question, but good question. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation.
can you please speak a little bit about NIT uh, regarding what's the level uh, of the company development that you usually engage in? Does it need to be a uh, well-established company, certain budget, or like one person with an idea? What's what's the range? Well, so the NMIT right now is largely more of an idea that I'm socializing on my own, and, we, and I'm hoping in the next six to nine months we've got actually an entity that would uh, would focus on it. But our, but our focus is largely going to be on early stage, uh, meaning somebody's got a great idea and maybe a product or service uh, uh, focused in New Mexico for entrepreneurs that are local. That's the that's the notion, and, and you know, as Paula well knows, uh, one of the challenges in New Mexico is that you've got a lot of really uh, resilient, intelligent entrepreneurs, but they don't have the context or the surrounding ecosystem that they might have in Silicon Valley, yeah. where you can plug in an investor or an advisor or a salesperson or a lawyer. They just don't exist, and so the problem is that creates that creates a struggle in being able to. Uh, create an investor-ready company, and so part of the, the notion of the NMIT is to surround these entrepreneurs with entrepreneur with resources and mentors, so that you can essentially provide uh, some capital to get them to a fundable state. Yeah, and a space to innovate. Exactly, exactly right. That's great. Need exactly. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I, I have another question. Yes, sir. Do you think, uh, you know, with these layoffs in tech companies and, uh, you yep. know, all that's going on, is that just uh, a function of the fears of recession or that the tech era is, you know, coming to? to no. So, so yeah, the, your question is, are these layoffs, and I think they were up to 150,000, something like that? Um, um, ones that are public. Well, yeah, ones that are public. Uh, the question is, are, is this, a, you know, a, uh, an indictment of tech sort of changing? Is it about economics? So my, my belief is that it's all about uh, optimizing the quality of their workforces. It yeah. uh, has nothing to do with the recession, has nothing to do with their stock price, has nothing to do with, it's about, we grew, you know, Facebook and Am Amazon had what, 500,000 employees last year? These companies, when they grow at this geometric rate, the odds of being able to hire people that are hardworking, intelligent, match your culture, uh, are pretty close to zero. So the, there's a bunch of comp a bunch of people in these companies, and, and by the way, this isn't because they're bad people. Uh, they just don't. They're just not the right people for those companies. I'm always a big believer that it's not about the person; it's about the fit. And a person who's not performing in one company can perform extraordinarily well in another company because the fit's better. So my theory, my, my hypothesis, is most of these layoffs are because these companies have said, "Look, we've hired a whole bunch of people." The odds are pretty high that 10 and 20 between 10 and 20 percent of them aren't the right fit, and and we're just going to uh, we're going to lay them off because that allows us to get back to a more lean culture and allows us to uh, you know to preserve the kind of forward growth trajectory that we need. The one exception to that is Twitter, uh, and uh, I, I have some expertise with Twitter because my sister used to work at Twitter. Um, she worked with them for a long time and uh, actually was working for them in the last three years in Chama of all places, which is where she lives. And she's got a Starlink satellite dish in Chama and she's doing stuff online. And uh, Twitter, uh, when it went public, the stock, the stock didn't do anything since it went public. I mean, that, that company's been a financial uh, disaster. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason is that um, most of the employees at Twitter would get large restric restricted stock option grants, it's called RSUs, restricted stock units. Um, they be paid extraordinarily well. I remember I visited my sister when she was working in the San Francisco office, you know, three meals a day. Um, it wasn't really a job. It was a social experiment where everybody got, you know, handed out large paychecks based on the, on the, on the stock. And so there was no, um, there was no culture of uh, you know, employees are, are being paid for the contribution that they make to the overall growth of the business. So, you know, I, I, think, I think Elon said he could probably lay off three quarters of the workforce and not lose a beat, he laid off, I think, half. Um, he probably laid off some of the wrong people, but that's always what happens in these circumstances. I also think, I, I said the ones that we know of. So uh, yes. there's lots of other companies who do this right-sizing regularly, yeah. yes. tech companies, like Oracle. I mean, yes. Oracle. Companies that do an annual performance, well, most companies do an annual performance review, and a lot of these companies say, you know, every year we're gonna, we're gonna take 10% of our workforce out just because we know we hired 10% of them wrong during the year. Doesn't matter what size they are. So they were 200 employees at the end of year one. They'll lay off, you know, 20. Yeah. If they're 400 employees at the end of year two, they'll lay off 40. 
if there are a thousand employees in the end of year three, they'll lay off, a, you know, a hundred. Yeah. It's just the way they do it. It's, and yeah. some businesses go, go yeah. up, you know, that they have multiple businesses and others go down. Yeah. I mean, so. I, managing the workforce in tech, I always said, you better have a plan B. Right. If you work in tech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You had a question? Yeah, um, I'm just curious about the net promoter score again. Um, right. So if you have a really bad net promoter score, like you had really successful companies on there in the negatives. Right. Like, do do they try to turn that around, or sure. do they kind of just accept it and then invest an immense amount in marketing, or how does that? Yeah. So they, they what they really should what they have to do and what they should do are not necessarily the same, but what they have to do is spend more money on marketing because they've, they've got to make up for this negative score. But what they should be doing at the same time. Is improving their um, their net promoter score and their brand, uh, mm -hmm. which essentially allows them over some length of time to reduce their marketing costs. Because you you can't change a net promoter score overnight; it takes time. And, and I don't know if you've any of you flown late, lately, but what I've noticed in particular in flying is that United um, seems to have deliberately made a, a positive change in how they run their business. Because I, I find that that experience of flying on United uh, is much more positive than it was five years ago. Five years ago, I'd never fly on United because they were always angry. Um, After 9-11, they were just uh, and, and American too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, that, so even though you might have a negative score or, or a low score, um, you can do something about that. But it requires, uh, particularly in a, in a consumer-facing business, like an airline, um, you, you need to um, you need to do a lot with respect to employee training, uh, employee compensation, um, data collection, uh, and so it, it can't be fixed. But you do they do net promoter scores on products and services yeah. separately? Because let's say yeah. you have a product like like yeah. Microsoft who has very mm -hmm. a monopoly on right. that market, right. but. So they may get a net promoter score yep. on the product, but if they could work on their service. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they, you can drill down in any particular way you want. Yeah. yeah. So it all, all depends on the company's propensity for collecting data. And, I, and I've known some companies to say, we don't need to do this at all. Yeah. We know our customers really well. You know, we don't need to be told. We don't need the data, which to me is a, creates concern. All right, well, thank you all very much. Oh, well, that was a good point because, yeah, Disney had a Yeah, that's yeah, what I thought right. immediately yeah. would have thought. Yeah. That seems strange to me, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So is that in the theme parks? Yeah. Is that, you know, in the streaming business? I, I, I don't know. Yep. But again, that snapshot was taken, I don't know when I pulled it off the web. It was, it was not current. So all these things change quickly. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John.